Good morning, everyone. I'm here for another edition of Quorum Live. I'm Julie Livingston of Want Leverage Communications, and I'm so thrilled you're joining me here for this series of conversations with Quorum Initiative members and friends, um, where we talk about how women can affect change in the workplace, how we can get more female representation on corporate boards, and more investment in female-owned and led companies. I'm delighted today to welcome my guest, Susan Lindner. She's the founder and CEO of Innovation Storytellers, a leading innovation storytelling consulting firm. She's a sought after keynote speaker, workshop leader, messaging strategist, and storytelling coach. Susan draws upon her experiences as an anthropologist. I love that, and I wanna hear more about that, Susan. <laughs> an international aid worker in rural Thailand in the 90s where she shared stories that helped at-risk populations affected by AIDS and to slow the, the virus's spread. Um, I mean, what an inspiration. Today, Susan leverages those same storytelling skills to inspire innovation leaders around the globe to become incredible storytellers and ensure that their innovations and big ideas get the resources, runway, and recognition they deserve. Susan hosts the popular podcast, Innovation Storytellers, which features interviews with global leaders from companies such as Amazon, Bloomberg, and Cisco about the stories that move their innovations forward past the boardroom, the laboratory, and production line, and into our everyday lives. So welcome, Susan. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Julie. And, you know, I, I'd lo just love to give a shout out to the Quorum Initiative. I think the women of this organization are doing such amazing things in the boardroom and beyond. And it's why you've been able to assemble such an incredible community. So um, just happy to be part of it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I feel similarly <laughs> for sure. So positioning, positioning yourself as a, an innovator um, is something you've done successfully throughout your career. So I'd love to hear more about how you got started in this, especially your beginnings in on the ground in Thailand, um, I think is fascinating. So if you could share some of that, Susan, that would be great. Sure. Um, you know, I, I never really thought of storytelling, really, or the work that I was doing as storytelling um, until I got back home. Um, and I think for many people, storytelling kind of finds them in ways they weren't necessarily seeking out. My time in Thailand was in the early 90s when HIV was running rampant through Southeast Asia and so many other parts of the world. Um, I was working for the biggest nonprofit organization in Thailand and um, working on all different kinds of development projects, but spent a lot of time working in brothels doing HIV education with wow. workers and their customers. And my nickname was condom girl because I used to go jogging in the morning and hand out condoms in the market because where I lived, <laughs> one in six sexually active people were HIV positive And there were about three AIDS funerals a day where I lived. Wow. It was intense. It's just incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so my task was, um, helping to figure out how could we slow the spread of HIV um, in a place where women were seeing up to eight customers a night. And so if you can, I mean, just as women, the thought of, of having sex I, eight times in a night is, is baffling, even with a partner that you enjoy. I mean, it's brutal. Right. Much less um, having sex with people that you don't know about, you don't know if they're safe, and you don't know if you're going to walk away from the interaction um, safe, safely and, and healthy as well. And so um, the way the Minister of Public, the Ministry of Public Health was handling it was using these shock and awe fear campaigns, get AIDS and die. Literally, there were billboards um, as you were driving down the highway that said get AIDS and die. And they were terrifying. And but by the way, they worked. They worked for about six months and then we would see infection rates climb again. And so this was really challenging because as marketers, when we find something that works, what do we do? We double down on it. And so then we went through another cycle of shock and awe. But you get this kind of boy who cried wolf because 
in public health, and we all saw it during COVID, so much of this was reminiscent of it for me, is you put out a fear message, it works for a while, people are terrified, and then people go, wait a minute, I didn't get COVID, I'm fine. Right. Exactly. Like Why that. do I need to mask and do all the, get a booster and I'll do all this stuff? Right. Why do I need to wear a condom every single time? I'm fine. Nothing's ever happened to me. So why should I worry about it? And so this was this was the challenge of any public health worker. And so as an anthropologist, it seemed that we weren't getting to the heart of the matter. And so at, as an anthropologist, we use techniques like ethnography, where we interview people and find out about their lives and what matters to them. And we use appreciative inquiry, which is a style of questioning um, and interviewing that says, what are we doing that's working and how can we build on it? So it's the mm. opposite of a fear and scare campaign. So appreciative inquiry allows you to appreciate and grow the stuff that's working. So we started asking my three target groups, the mamasans, typically women who own the brothels. And I should mention prostitution is illegal in Thailand. Um, it's largely run, you know, and funded with organized crime money, but for the most part, um, it, it's illegal. It's still very easy to purchase sex. But for the mamasans, we asked them, you know, what's most important to you? And they said, making money. And I said, what's really important to you? And they said, you know, I want my establishment to be here for the long term. They had already had an experience where most of their first brothels went out of business because all of the workers had died and many of their customers. Oh. So like, how do I build a business based on longevity? That's what we heard when we asked deeper questions. And for the customers, obviously they were looking for a night of pleasure, which was a typical night out. You go out for dinner with some friends, you have a couple of drinks, you can go to hear live music, you could go and shoot pool, or you can go to a brothel. No stigma, no nothing. That's a typical night. And we said, what do you really want if you're going to go to a brothel? And these men would say, I want to be the protector of my family. And I want to ensure that my wife and future children don't get HIV. And for the women, we asked them, what did they want? And they said they wanted to survive. And I said, so if you survived, what would come next? And they said, I just want to be in control of my own destiny. Mm -hmm. I want to be in control of my future because HIV ends that. And so we started putting together um, entrepreneurship programs for these women to help women who wanted to get out of sex work to start their own small businesses. So this girl from the Bronx was teaching chicken raising, pig raising, and duck raising, along with my phenomenal Thai colleagues who really showed me how to do this work because I had no clue. And, um, and also other skills like computer skills and um, even gem cutting. I was in the Golden Triangle. It's an area rich in rubies, emeralds, and, and sapphires. And so we teach them how to cut and polish gems. And so, you know, the pivotal part of the storytelling, which I only realized when I came home, was how do I make my listener the hero of the story? And so when I started doing marketing and PR for startups in the 90s at the, at the height of the internet boom, I started to ask the question of the startups that I was working with, how do I, how do we make your customer the hero of the story? And so we started talking about the customer's the hero. And then we just kept figuring out using appreciative inquiry, using ethnography, trying to figure out um, the answer to that question. What would make them feel like the hero? Because when you designate a hero, then people, um, those heroes begin telling their friends. Oh, and absolutely. I mean, so, so, I mean, you started to say how, why storytelling is important at work, mm. but tell us about why it's so critical for women. Yeah. Well, because I think we falter at this. Yeah. And by the way, the way men and women tell stories and what the way those stories are received are very different. And it hasn't been that long that outside of the home that women are in positions of authority where men are willing to listen. And I'm constantly reminded of the um, the anecdotes we heard out of the Obama administration, someone who you think is really open minded, has, you know, had a had a 
woman as a boss before they married, right? <laughs> Michelle was Obama, was Barack's boss prior, right? Prior to him um, becoming the president, and women in even Obama's cabinet said that they would strategize before they went into a cabinet meeting and they would say, okay, I'm going to bring up a new resolution. I'm going to bring up a new concept. And then their two other female um, cabinet members would say, great, you bring up the idea. I'm going to ask you to repeat the idea. A third woman is going to say, but I have a question about that idea. And they planned and strategized how they would speak in the boardroom so that they would be heard. And that was the way I'm imagining in most cases where they were able to be heard, be seen as innovative, be, be listened to and to move their idea forward. Right. Because what we found in working in innovation and specifically around innovation storytelling is that you need other advocates for a breakthrough idea in order for the idea to be heard, received, and for it to be shared with someone else. And so, you know, getting into the tech world, you always need early adopters, people who are willing to try the technology, right. give it a shot. But that's also the case of ideas. You know, especially when you're sharing an idea, it needs the force of a crowd. It needs endorsement. It needs testimonial. It needs um, other ways of really rooting an idea that can seem really ethereal when you first suggest it. It's kind of like planting the seeds, right, for something to grow, um, to set it up, to set the stage for it to be um, nurtured. Right. And I would say the seed is the idea, but you really need the soil and the water from you know other people around you to ensure that it grows. Otherwise, it can very easily blow away. Someone else can pick up your seeds and plant the idea and pretend it's theirs. There are lots of other things that are going on that can make... Um, innovation storytelling challenging, especially in highly politicized um, corporate environments or organizational environments too. So what is, you're using this term innovation storytelling. Um, what is the difference between storytelling, just generic storytelling and innovation storytelling? And okay. why again, is that so critical for women? So if you have an idea that's asking people to change, or, and especially if you're asking them to change behavior, you need to physically move them. You need to overcome inertia. So a regular story may be, let me tell you about my weekend. Let me tell you about an experience I had. Let me tell you about a customer. These are all fantastic stories. We're very familiar with the arc of um, problem, action, result. You know, like here's the problem. Here's the action we took to solve it. Here's the result that we got. Fantastic. That's been around in marketing forever. Innovation storytelling is when you are trying to get across a new idea, uh, a new product, a new service, a prototype, or a behavior change, right? Maybe even social change. So that requires something different, and it requires a lot more consensus building on the front end of a story than you would need if you were just saying, oh, I cut my hair, right? Or let me tell you about our production numbers for this quarter. And so let me, I'll walk you through what's different about that. So an innovation story requires a couple of things. Number one, that whomever you're talking to, that you create common ground with them, that you recognize you're about to make your listener, the person who is hearing your change story, you're asking them to change or to adopt a new idea. You're going to figure out ahead of time how to make them the hero. Step one. Step two is creating common ground is saying, I know where you are. I see where you're from. You and I share a history, good, bad, and ugly. And by the way, we typically connect more around this uh, shared difficulty and challenge than we do around triumph because the lessons are learned in the hard stuff. Right. So that's step two is find common ground and be able to talk about that. So I actually feel comfortable before getting in the car and asking you to drive into an uncertain future, let's make sure we come from the same place. So step three is now talking about a shift. Something in the world has radically changed. And as a result, we need to change. So that could be a macro shift, climate change, work from home, COVID, um, a whole host of things, economic issues, or it can be micro. We just had a, a shift in leadership 
and now the strategy has changed. We might be opening up new markets. We might have um, new challenges based on regulation, right? So those are happening at my company level or my organizational level. So identify what the shift is and then make really clear we can't stay in the status quo. On either side of this shift, once I get buy-in that my listener is on board, there will be winners and there will be losers. If we stay in the status quo, we will lose. Give me an example. I mean, this this is just resonating so deeply because one of the things that the Quorum Initiative is very much behind is, um, well, creating a pathway for women to advance, but also to... Uh, to increase female representation on corporate boards. Mm. And I think that that whole diversity, the whole diversity issue is something that we constantly have to storytell about. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, once we figure out this shift, if I can say to people, okay, life isn't the same since George Floyd, let's say, right? Or life isn't the same since Roe v. Wade. That may be, that's a huge shift. But if we stick to doing what we're doing, we will lose. Yeah. Um, however, the other side of that, there are already people who are doing it right, is the next thing we say. Once we acknowledge the shift and my listener gets on board and I see heads wagging across the table, yes, I recognize that shift. Yes, I see there's something we have to do about it. Great, doing nothing will kill us. Doing something and the right thing will mean everything. So now I want an example of who's actually doing it right, right now. So it can be someone from my industry. It can be one of my competitors. It can be Amazon, Facebook, you know, um, a, a large entity that's doing something right. Um, or small upstarts, right, who might disrupt us. Um, Airbnb is doing it right when Hilton had no idea what was coming at them, right? So I can show examples that way. And then I say, let me tell you, if we take this leap, what it could look like. Mm. So now I want to show them what heaven looks like. Right. So you're kind of helping them envision what the change can, can produce. Right. So an innovation story has to paint a picture of a future that's better than the one we have now. However, okay. my job is not to offer heaven. That's too big, too much. Um, and I can't pretend that I have all the solutions. I'm not fixing climate change, one woman, one company, right? Not going to happen. But I can talk about what it could be like. My job is just to show them what is the next right step. So if you're trying to affect change in your organization, all you have to do is say, what is the next right step? But I want to set up the big picture so I can say, we're going in the right direction. Okay. Right. Step four is a technique we call breadcrumbing. And breadcrumbing means looking backwards. So if I want to get people to change today, I have to prove to them that they're capable of it, that we have the resources, and that we've done it before. So when I look backwards, I say, we've already made great investments in climate change. We've already done some heavy lifting, and we've had phenomenal results. We did that, and we can do it again. So breadcrumbing is a process of looking backwards, like Hansel and Gretel, to find our way. Mm -hmm finding our way into the future. So then and only then do I actually present the big idea. So you notice I haven't told them what I want them to do yet. This is all the setup to the amazing story. So by positioning all of these changes along the way, people are, I'm incorporating them into a story where they get to be the hero at the end. And then and only then do I give them the idea of what I actually want them to do because now they're primed because nobody wants to change. All we get when we ask people to change is a whoosh of stress hormones. We get <laughs> adrenaline and cortisol running through our bodies. Innovators, they like change. The rest of humanity, no thank you. No. <laughs> yeah, and I think women can also just in general be fearful of change just because you know they've had, they've had to fight so hard to get to where they are that doing even more can be can be intimidating. Why and in that, why should women have their own brand story, Susan? Because and how could we get started? Yeah, you know, because if you don't create your story, someone else will. I mean, as basic as that, if you're not able to identify your story and and determine who you are in your spaces, 
then someone else will define you. And that is inherently um, a limiting opportunity because all the women listening are limitless, but other people will define you as less than that. So that's the reason I feel like every woman has to have her own brand story. So I would ask you to think about where are the shifts? Just like I was naming, you know, whether I'm trying to introduce a new idea or a new product or service, um, I would ask you, where have been the big shifts in your life? Because those have been the places where you have probably assumed power and come yeah. out on the other side even stronger. So take a look at your own lifeline, career-wise or your entirety of your life. Women, we go through so many changes, men can't even fathom, right? It's growing up, it's leaving our childhood things behind. Why do men still get to play with action figures and video games where women don't? Like there are no rites of passage for men that say, put your toys away, right? We're not still playing with Barbies at 50. But, <laughs> but, but so anyway, those demarcations of life are opportunities where you will see your own self as a hero. The, your own places where you have been victorious or maybe places where you have fallen down. By the way, no great story has no drama. You must have drama in order to have a fantastic story. You must have challenge. So don't leave those out of your story. That's Plus, and who does it? I mean, that's just the right. part of life. But that's also where your listener connects with you. So yeah. if you're in a recruiting situation or you're talking about, you know, what I hit my quarterly goals, don't leave out all the obstacles because the fact that you increase sales by 75%, talk about how hard it was to do that thing. If you describe it as effortless, all you're doing is setting unreal expectations for the person that you're talking to. So right. really you're not showcasing your innovative thinking and problem yeah. solving. Right? And if you surmounted the obstacle. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We don't leave out the tough stuff. That's actually where we connect. It's actually where we develop empathy for the person across the table for us. And they go, oh my gosh, me too. Wasn't that horrible? That was really hard. I don't know how we did it. I love this. And and it really is prompting so many thoughts about my own storytelling. And in, in my professional life, I'm a LinkedIn expert and a mm -hmm. publicist. So I'm always telling somebody's story. And um, and always changing it up. You know, there was, there's this, because we live in a digital world, I'm able to do that. But um, I have found that when I do tell my clients stories and I do express times where they were, you know, challenged, where they had to, you know, kind of climb up a hill, it really resonates so strongly. There's no question about it. You know, and you think about it in the world of sports. And by the way, I'm allergic to most sports. Don't enjoy that. <laughs> but um, and I've outlawed sports metaphors because I don't understand them in most of my most of my professional life. But how boring would it be to just watch Michael Jordan shoot three pointers from you know from half court for an hour? The the what's exciting is that he conquers the other team, right? Of LeBron James figuring out the most incredible strategies, like. That's the drama. That's the action that we want to hear. If you just go, I increased sales. I doubled my team. Like there's nothing there. There's nothing there for us to hold on to as humans. We connect, you know, the agony creates the empathy. So in terms of, you know, at Quorum, we like to talk about how we can actually affect change. How can we start um, embracing innovation storytelling for ourselves, um, how should women, how should our members and friends get started? Yeah. So is it looking at, I don't know, because I'm on LinkedIn all the time. I'm thinking, is it looking at your profile and then kind of really dissecting it even more and then kind of pulling out those things that perhaps were buried? Yeah. Or if you, you know, think about the top three lines of your resume, right? They're probably the things you're most proud of, the things you've got accomplished. I would just ask you to think about tough verbs that you might incorporate into that line of results, overcame massive obstacles in, you know, emerging markets to hit 65% growth, right? If you can incorporate a little bit of the drama into that discussion, all the better. And 
Um, the other thing is a tool that I like to use before I ever tell a story, by the way, number one skill in storytelling is actually listening, not speaking. So knowing your audience and what motivates their behavior, not just mm. their personality, but what motivates their behavior. So part of design thinking work is using something called an empathy map. Typically, computer programmers and developers use this to figure out a customer experience with a new piece of software. I love using it before I create a story. And so I'm asking tough questions, especially ones like, what is the pain and what is the potential gain of the idea that I'm proposing to my listener? What will they get out of my idea and what will give them pain in executing my idea? If I can anticipate those two questions before I offer a new idea at work, then I'm 50% there. And creating empathy for what I'm really asking someone to do and how hard what I'm doing um, and what I'm asking of them is, um, is great for us to go, wow, I just want them to get it done. What the, is the problem? Okay, take a step back. Yeah. Ask the question, what is their pain and what is their potential gain? Um, and you'll just find you're gaining so many more allies at work when you stop for a moment and cr try to create a little empathy map about what motivates them. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. um, where can people get in touch with you, Susan? Absolutely. Well, LinkedIn is my favorite place to be. So absolutely. Um, they can find me on LinkedIn, Susan Lindner, or they can subscribe to the Innovation Storytellers podcast, um, where I interview chief innovation officers and folks with an innovation mandate in their title or in their job description uh, every week. And it's um, just great, great ideas, not just about the innovation, but what stories you tell to get your innovation to the finish line. That's what we cover on the podcast. And it's a lot of fun. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I really, I, I think, well, you've inspired me complete to really kind of um, rethink how I, uh, how I present my own brand story and, and certainly that of my clients. And um, I think I have my homework laid out for me. <laughs> well, I'm <laughs> your coach, Julie. You just say when. Bring me your best story. I'm here to help. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much. And Thanks. I'll see everyone else on another edition of Quorum Live very soon.